Global Health Global Research Infection and Capital Step Lecture Series at the lecture number 16. On, today we have with us Dr. John Bakarimba. He was the former principal safeguard policy specialist at the Asian Development Bank. So we warmly welcome him to today's lecture, which is on resettlement, livelihood, restoration and poverty, some international experiences. So let me give a, a small introduction about um, Dr. Pereira. He is a development anthropologist and a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute in London. So, uh, his uh, main area of work uh, was as the principal safeguard policy specialist at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, in Manila was on the involuntary resettlement environment and indigenous people in South Asia. He was also the deputy director agrarian relation and poverty of the Hector Kupak Agrarian Research Institute and was also senior research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. His uh, main areas of interest are involuntary resettlement, indigenous people, environmental law and practice, international law, irrigation, water management, and agrarian change. He has been, uh, he has publications, well over 60 uh, articles and book chapters, and these are some of his key uh, books and book chapters. New Dimension of Social Stratification in Rural Sri Lanka, Conflict and Change, a Portrait of Sri Lankan, Village, an introduction to sociology in Sinhala, classical sociologists, their theories and methods, which is also in Sinhala, and education development and agrarian change, challenges in implementing best practices in involuntary resettlement, a case study in Sri Lanka. Of the edited books, uh, Land and Cultural Survival, the Communal Land Rights of Indigenous People in Asia, Transnational Culture and Expert Knowledge Responses from a Rural Community in Sri Lanka, Lost to Gain, Is Involuntary Resettlement a Developed Opportunity? Uh, his academic achievements, uh, he has a BA in Sociology from the University of Peradeniya and an MA and a PhD in Development Anthropology from the University of Sussex. Uh, from the prestigious Institute of Development Studies and an LLM in Environmental Law from the University of Wales. He's a Ford's Fellow. Uh, he was a Ford's Fellow at the University of Oxford and he taught several graduate courses in migration and uh, refugee studies. So uh, he has traveled uh, all over the world uh, and he has particular expertise in Pakistan and in many other Asian countries. And um, so I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Pereira to deliver his uh, lecture on resettlement, livelihood, restoration, and poverty, looking at some international experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. <laughs> um, what I, in this first slide, what I want to show you is this um, resettlement poverty, and uh, livelihood is a not single shot, but cyclical uh, process. If you read the resettlement uh, literature, you hardly find the word displacement, simply because the resettlement policy and practice as well as laws are geared to deal with consequences of uh, displacement and it's much easier than dealing with displacement per se. That's the basic point. So actually resettlement is a second stage. Start with the displacement that is um, physical or economic or both. Then uh, resettlement is, is a recovery and it can happen with or without relocation. And there will be certain uncertainties built in. They are the uh, pre-displacement. You have uncertainties. Sometimes people wait 5, 6, 7, 10, 15 years on the rumors that their land will be 
acquired, but nothing happened. So they waited and the government won't do anything in that area because say pretty soon that area will be developed under another project and so on. There are so many uh, uncertainties. Then the resettlement time also people have problems of income. Then post resettlement people are worried about their children and the next generation. So there are all step by step building into a vulnerability. People are becoming more and more vulnerable when they move from displacement to resettlement and post resettlement years. I'm talking about sometimes 15 years to 20 years period according to some calculations. So norm normality means when people start to take part in uh, social, economic and political activities in the areas and it can start as early as within two years or after 10 years. Mr. Pavati, when you talk about environment and social sustainability, these are very uh, well-known words, but very few people would understand the importance of that in, in the area of uh, safeguards. I must say that uh, safeguards are about sustainability. It could, it could be environmental sus, uh, sustainability or it could be social sustainability of the people and the individual who got affected. So we say environment and social uh, policy area, we talk about uh, safeguards as the cornerstone of green economic growth. That means it protects the environment for future generations and biodiversity. Then uh, resources and services for our, that means everybody's well-being. So that is the basic idea of environment and social sustainability from the safeguard point of view also. So for, for this reason, safeguard uh, policies, when I say safeguard policies, it includes environment, social and environment resettlement and uh, indigenous people and several other. So what we normally find in our literature and in our practice, places like World Bank, ADB, or uh, various other multilateral agencies is to avoid. This is one of the most interesting uh, uh, policies because they start with avoid. It won't say do anything. You say avoid land acquisition. So uh, I had a chance to go through the... Uh, recent, most recent uh, draft of the ADB's uh, safeguard policy, its, uh, it's uh, environment and social policy says, avoid or mitigate economic and physical displacement or disruption of livelihoods due to land acquisition and land use restrictions and improve at, or at least restore the standards of living of the project affected people. So from 1995 all the way to 2025 now, we find no change in that policy statement. They all say avoid. So the World Bank and ADB are now going to adopt that. It's called environment and social standards. Uh, uh, land acquisition and land use restriction. It's very cat categorical and very short statement now. It's called avoid economic and physical displacement or when unavoidable, minimize such displacement. This is the latest from the ADB's uh, draft. So how do you do that? By mitigating, because unavoidable means you still have to go with the project. If you say avoid and stop there, then no, no, I don't think 95 projects will go ahead. So you say stop or avoid. But you say if you can't avoid, then there are so many things to do. That's the policy says. One main thing is it says uh, help people to rebuild their income. That means to stop their moving towards uh, poverty or um, radical poverty by giving them um, sufficient money as compensation at the cost, it's called the uh, full replacement cost. 
this word is now included full early it was replacement cost now it's full replacement cost that means not only you should pay money but they should that money should be paid as early as possible before people are physically moved from their lands so you see so replacement cost compensation is to help people in their own effect in their own efforts to improve or at least restore. So whole responsibility is now with the people. Early it was the responsibility of the uh, borrower or the project owner to improve the improve or at least to restore the uh, income levels of the people relative to pre-displacement level or to the level of previ uh, previous previously pri prior to the project implementation. Now it is gone to the level the, the the project affected people should take their uh, should take the initiative and their effort to improve their lifestyle, but with the help of this money. So and, uh, the assumption is full replacement cost ideally would help people to keep the same status or to improve their income levels. And I will come back to the practice how it practically how it is possible. So second point is, one is to pay them full replacement cost. Second one is um, improve livelihoods and living standard of the vulnerable and poor people. So vulnerable and poor people, we are coming again to that point. So I just read, this is the, this is the that's all the policy says. All other things are uh, descriptions, to give a house, to give them electricity to give them enough loans and uh, uh, security of tenure and so on, but basically pay them sufficient money and help them to improve their uh, income sources. So this is the policy. So let us see how, how far we can uh, see in our own experience. So I, I read that earlier, so compensation at full, Replacement cost, and this one we discuss. Yeah. Improve livelihood, living condition of disadvantaged and vulnerable people. Improve. Improve is only for disadvantaged and vulnerable people. Very difficult to define the word vulnerable and uh, the poor. Disadvantaged and poor is very difficult to define. So only in that case, the policy says they are uh, uh, life chances or living standards or income should be improved by adequate housing, essential services, and skill training. Now we see the, the debate at the moment. So the basic principle, whether it's World Bank, ADB, or European Development Bank, they say ensure the non-poor would not become poor because of the land acquisition and land utilization restrictions. Second its point is avoid the poor becoming poorer. The third is emphasis is on rest, uh, income restoration, not on improvement. Short, so the World Bank, OED, as early as 1998, raised this issue with the Board of Governors, saying, why do you want to restrict the improvement only to the vulnerable and poor because a project is meant for primary beneficiaries, that is everybody. If everybody is going to get be the primary beneficiaries, why do you uh, avoid this long-term objective of improvement of productivity, better living standards, and keep it only for the disadvantage and vulnerable? Not Why not for the all project affected people? This is a debate going in even now. So World Bank management in 1999 reasserted income restoration is the minimum benchmark for a successful resettlement. It is a cardinal principle now. With nobody, uh, the ADB in 2023 st still stick to the same principle because nobody would like to put income restoration is the minimum. No, would, no, no person would say income improvement is the minimum benchmark for successful resettlement. This is a political decision, no, and no government would like to take that responsibility. And it says 
we we are that means the world bank management accepted the fact income improvement is necessary if the people are poor and vulnerable but if you if you go to the field and see uh, check what is happening there is no big difference between these two groups not very well demarcated relationship between these two people there is more or less the same so because of this distinction restoration for the all affected people improvement for only the poor and the vulnerable there are some issues i'm just been rapidly one is the uh, as, as i said earlier defining the poor and the vulnerable is difficult full re uh, replacement cost does it cover all losses or it is only for the land losses that question is not well addressed in the policies then additional assistance to poor vulnerable is it a part of replacement cost or it is an additional grant there are different uh, shades of interpretation of that issue then the difference between replacement and market values in sri lankan government and india always uh, you know argue this matter in the law in our land acquisition act law market value is what matters not the replacement your replacement value doesn't make any sense it is a su subjective statement according to them as a result there's hesitation to use replacement cost in uh, official documents and they prefer to use the market value and uh, replacement actually goes beyond the cash compensation to income to include the income restoration also but that's from the the bank's point of view but uh, governments are reluctant to uh, go that far so one major argument against the replacement cost is it is difficult to find similar land if the land is acquired when the land is acquired if you are going to give a replacement land that is difficult or property you can't find especially in urban areas no land available to replace so why should we put replace replacement cost it varies because land land price spec uh, speculation um, you know all sort of arrangements therefore you can pin down and say this is the value of the land so it's difficult to go for the so what matter, what really matters is even the uh, world bank today stick to this the, the distinction between the uh, income restoration and income uh, uh, improvement it is such a small thing but in the field it makes a huge difference in uh, planners and uh, people who implement them so in as early as 2001 in sri lanka we have uh, what's called the resettlement and poverty reduction for, for the purpose of resettlement and poverty reduction we have national national involuntary resettlement policy 2001 it never became a law but it is pretty powerful uh, document and uh, adb found uh, and, and the world bank also found it is sufficient document to reflect the uh, their safeguard policies in the area of resettlement so the principles are very uh, aspirational that means uh, equitable and fair manner these are good good wishes but very difficult to pin down and explain but all should be treated equitable and fair manner so caps mean project affected people caps are not impoverished because of the land acquisition it doesn't make any sense because then you should apply avoid concept if you apply avoid if if unavoidable do these things uh, impoverishment because of land acquisition cannot be uh, achieved anywhere in the world so far and again a very innovative thing about the policy was establishment of land acquisition and resettlement committee lark it it it, it look into various aspects of people's life and uh, that's the most important thing because uh, people were very happy to get more uh, assistance in different forms not necessarily large sum of money they like to get a piece of land they like to get uh, help in uh, uh, home gardening or educating their children and so on so so that sort of uh, arrangement you can find in these committees established under nirp 
So if you go to uh, Southern Transport Development Project, Highway Project, I can give you a good example there. Calculation of statutory compensation was decided according to the government rules and regulations by the land valuer. Then, according to the law, you can't pay anything officially under statutory compensation other than statutory compensation. But they, with the cabinet approval in 2001, under the NIRP, that is National uh, Involuntary Settlement Policy, they, they determined uh, some extra share payments under LARC through consultations. I'll come to that. What are those payments? Then payment of cash compensation to a state uh, state commercial or commercial bank account for the each family, keeping husband and wife both as the uh, account holders. So those are the powerful uh, uh, improvements in Sri Lankan uh, recent history, thanks to the policy. So we let us go and see what is happening there. So statutory compensation when the government paid uh, in uh, Southern Highway, what they found was agricultural land got the lowest money. And 70% of people who are affected in the project area were farmers. So they got the lowest. Homesteads, people who had uh, uh, pear trees and uh, rubber and sort of small scale things, they got highest. But it is negligible if you compare with the what agricultural landowners got. Then, LARC, as I said, that committee started to check how to give these people more money. One thing they did was 25% of Statutory compensation was paid as an extra share payment, subject to 25,000 rupees the lowest, because some people have only one perch. But still, each family affected got 25,000 rupees at least as 25% of statutory compensation. You understand that? So they, are, they got the, the legal amount and get another 25% more. Then, to encourage people to go out of the area because of the land pressure, they were each family was offered uh, hundred thousand rupees. It's a lot of money that time, two thousand one, and they were told, "We give you hundred thousand. You go and find a way, place and and as many as eight hundred. That means about the uh, forty percent of affected people left the project affected area." And they disappeared to Ratnapur and various I, I I found recently most of them are, them are doing very well because they were risk takers. They took the risk and they had the initial money that is hundred thousand, then twenty five percent, and then statutory compensation and so on. And they went away. And some people got the piece of land as a dowry one day for someone told me for his daughter, and he also went away, but keeping that land in the project area to uh, appreciate. But what we found was business recovery was pretty bad. And uh, as late, late as 2013, they were still struggling to establish their what they had pre-project level. So, so when you go to the business, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, small kade and the kade and you know small rubber seller, that sort of people, and they found it's too bad. Why? In retrospect, I, I find it is too short notice. People are given notice. Earlier they heard the rumor. Rumors come first. Then the officials come with their, you know, armored cars, so to speak, and say, uh, we want to uh, serve your land. And this is the rule. And they put a notice, section two, section four, like that. Automatic and people don't know what's happening. And too short notice for the business recovery because suddenly businesses were out of job. Then there, there was a trauma of loss of network. So some people were very unhappy about uh, losing their jobs. I know a place called uh, Kurunduva Hatak Junction. There was a thriving business community in the pre-project level. If you go now, that thriving, thriving business community has disappeared and it was taken a little bit further in. When you take further in, outsiders came and captured the, uh, the stalls. Earlier, it's, it, it, it was organic community. 
So organic community was dispersed because of land acquisition. And but it's reestated was not the same people, about 30, 40 percent of the people in the new uh, shopping center. Let's say shopping center is uh, they are outsiders. So some business people complain that they can't find alternative locations to start their business. As I said earlier, then delays. People waited without reinvesting their money, partly because they got the money late. Uh, 2002 allocated money was paid as late as 2006 to 2008 because the treasury didn't have money because of the war. And it was, it was, uh, it was told that uh, we can't, we don't have money to pay and if you can, you find money. But according to the policy, we couldn't do that at that time. Then, other thing is, if you travel even today along the road, you find half-built and well-built houses. About 87% of people are at least refurbished, if not rebuilt their houses with two-story building and so sort on. Of and uh, when we ask people, they said, once in a lifetime, we get a chance to put this much of money to build a house. So first we build a house, is good for our children. And later we uh, think about uh, the, the regional development is emphasized. So when the regional development comes, when we have a good house, we can do good business. That's not the, I mean, that's not a bad idea, but that was not true. <laughs> so um, some other people use their money for to go to Patragama, Vatavandana, um, large scale weddings, buy a car or motorbike, and the money was wasted. Not wasted, used for various other purposes. So as a result, business recovery was difficult. They, they were the people who really needed more money than the, the farmers. So non-title, this is the, I mean, if someone can boast about the Southern Highway project, one sentence, if you do, this is what you can say, the lack of title land is not a bar for compensation of research assistance. Our, our law does not recognize this category. They can have interest in the land. They can get a little bit of money as interest, but no rights. But the uh, thanks to uh, the uh, national policy of uh, 2001, they were also included. So what, what did they get? For the land improvement, they, they were paid. Struck, their structures were you know, damaged or lost, they were paid. And livelihood, source of income, let us say they were uh, cinnamon peelers or BD wrappers or like that. And they were paid some money. And they got about 10 purchases of land as squatters and 20 purchases paid to owners. So they got 10, 10 purchases, a lot of, you know, a lot of land in a um, resettlement site. And they were given some money to build a house, relocation allowance, although they don't have any land to lose because they are landless. So electricity, water supply, access roads. So it's a good package for a non-title person. And that is one of the greatest uh, landmarks in Sri Lanka's uh, resettlement uh, implementation. And interest and in, um, delayed. So 7% annual interest was also paid from 2001 when the land was acquired until the land was uh, occupied by the RD, that is uh, Roads Development Authority. But so this also, I found this is about 40, 45 million rupees. So people, are, so the, the package is going around. The money was circulating because of the resettlement project, partly because of ADV's influence, partly because of uh, this new, poli new policy is a large sum of money, but how to control, how to use this money was not properly taught or directed or advised people how to do these things. So this is one of the major problems in uh, management. So the, the question is, I would like to spend some time because this is area we were, you know, the very thorough. 
this last that means not the statutory but the other other packages excrasia packages did they actually restore or improve the household income in other words uh, whether the poor remains poor without becoming poorer and the poor has become non poor that's the in the in the uh, jargon of uh, poverty studies poor became uh, didn't become poorer and the poor the, the, the poorest actually become radical poor, like that, so many steps you can see. But here, the blanket statement is incomes decrease against pre-acquisition levels. It's uh, the statistics, it's a proven. That is, people's in <laughs> income went down. So it's a much bigger failure, all those, although we talk about various things. Main reason was 70% of acquired land is cultivated land, and people got very little land. And it was taken, they, they got a few thousand rupees and they, they didn't have enough money to buy new cultivated land. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't like to move to other areas. That means employment, because there were no other proper jobs. They were farmers. So they, did, they said, we don't know anything. So 70, that is a large number, more than two, about uh, more than two thirds of people who are not the, the recipient of this, uh, the attractive packages. That's one point. So loss of paddy land actually increased the vulnerability and the food, food insecurity. This was uh, somehow neglected in our studies. You know, very you know, I also did the study, but at that time we didn't look, uh, pay sufficient attention to this. Huh. How come the loss of paddy land increase vulnerability and food security? Because uh, people, the, the, our understanding, government and the RD's understanding was ADD also. This sort of a beautiful package of cash to give to people, they can diversify their income or they can go elsewhere and buy land. But both didn't work. One reason was they couldn't buy uh, paddy land because of non availability. That <laughs> was not available and people abandoning land. That time farming was not uh, lucrative enough even without the project. Then, because of the project's appearance in the, uh, the horizon, the land prices went up. So when the land prices went up, paddy lands price also went up because some people started to uh, use paddy lands for building purposes. So there are so many complicated uh, uh, movements of money in this area. So some people told us, some people means uh, out of 100, people I interviewed, about 50% people said, uh, so although your package is attractive, but it's not enough for us to buy any land or start a job. So some people got uh, 2 million, 3 million rupees sometimes. They said that's not good enough. Second thing is uh, the, the displaced people, physical displaced people were taken out of their area and resettled in uh, resettlement sites. So those sites are a bit far away from their paddy lands or their rubber lands. So distance was a big problem and the road was under construction. People were scared to go, especially women didn't want to go on the road when outsiders were around. So they just, you know, delayed. The payments were delayed. That means from 2001 to 2006, 7, 8, 9, payments were made in those installments. But no adjustment or revision negotiated. So they went on the 2001 rates. But by this time, uh, there were these people were forgotten a lot. 10 years past means nobody wanted to worry about their uh, life. People lack skills and capital, as I said, you know, new jobs. So what happened was progressive improve, uh, impoverishment. Slowly, people started to become impoverished. Although initially it was shown uh, early recovery is possible. For example, even a very bad time when the poorest in the villages were more than 12% of the total affected people, two thirds of people still say they had enough food throughout the year in 2010 survey. So other one third, that means uh, who thought thought they don't have enough food, they they started to sell their small pieces of land, borrowed from relatives, engage in casual work, and long hours of work to 
So the numbers remain the same. But 2002, uh, SEPA did a study and uh, it found two-thirds of affected families were on the recovery path. This is the basic uh, finding of that report. I don't dispute that because this is what people felt. They, they thought uh, the, the, the Messiah's arrival is all, almost there. They will be uh, redeemed by someone because the project is moving and a boy is going to be over this and that, and they, they expected they would get better deal. Then another finding was 30% of cash crop farmers who cultivated uh, uh, you know, cinnamon and other things, they were worse, in 2008, they were worse off. So you see the, uh, the these are large numbers, actual based on research, not uh, hearsay. And as a result, what, what, what we can see is a definite drop in productivity related to all crops, especially in rice, as I said earlier. Why? One was the road network obstructed drainage, irrigation, and transport. All over the place, people were talking about, we can, we can approach our land by the road because a lot of things are happening and uh, the heavy machinery destroyed our drainage and transport is difficult. We can't go to the other side of the road. There are no way to cross work sites and uncertainty. They don't know what is happening in that area. And the presence of uh, outsiders, heavy machinery, people are very worried. If there was some other uh, informal economy developed, uh, providing uh, illicit liquor and uh, all sorts of nefarious activities. The communities got fragmented. One group, a part of the village was this side, other part of the village, other side, or people are completely removed to a resettlement site, site and so on. People suddenly found they are not uh, cohesive communities. And then the distrust, anger, jealousy is all built up. So there are, there are 32 recent sites. And in each resettlement site, for a landowner who lost land, was given uh, 20 pets. Then, although you, you have a small home garden, uh, there, there was no common land for, uh, for uh, children to play or to, to dry their uh, paddy and so on. They are drastically curtailed. So people, uh, people had to think about new ways of living. Then access to other communities also badly affected, as I said earlier. I will, I will go rapidly because I want to give you a couple of examples from other countries also, but this is what we, what we find here is what we I found in other countries also. So this is much easier to discuss in, in this form. We had, you know, income restoration program, people think uh, these phases are uh, just ad hoc. No, there were three, three management agencies handled the income restoration program of uh, Southern Highway. The first phase was Finn Road, it's a European consultant company. We got this project, and at that time there was, there was about 60 million rupees allocated from the government for uh, income restoration of 1,600 families. It's quite a large amount of money. They did a good survey, um, social survey, poor and vulnerable. They identified 2,330 individuals as poor and vulnerable. So small things like bank account opening, husband, wife has joint venture, joint uh, account holders, home gardening, uh, employment training, like that. But there was no working definition of poor and uh, vulnerable. And the delays, as we discussed earlier, and RD, that is the Road Development Authority, has no knowledge about uh, income restoration project or activities because that is not their priority. Many engineers told me, look, first we have to build the road, then we talk about poverty and poverty alleviation program. We are not interested and we, are, we can get money from the treasury for that matter. So planning, so this fellows with the, I mean, 
people already started to move out of their land, but only 2007, the, uh, the field road consultants managed to go there and to uh, think about what is happening. And then people reported to uh, ADVCRP, that is the compliance review panel, they are not getting their uh, compensation and uh, uh, income restoration program. So government uh, ready-made answers, not enough money. Phase two, another comp uh, Saro there, it's called seeds. You know, seeds started doing it. It, 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 it was interesting uh, action, but it talked too much about peace, equity, uh, uh, you know, uh, the need for working with others, that sort of uh, more aspirational work rather than trying to train people in uh, uh, some jobs. Some people, you know, some young people told me a couple of places that uh, you know, about uh, compassion and peace. We don't want compassion and peace. We need uh, skills to learn and to earn living. So, um, but at the same time, I remember people were expected to benefit from the regional development programs, not from uh, household level handovers. So young people took money and went, you know, spread that money from their parents, thinking uh, we can have a nice time now, but pretty soon because of the road, there will be regional development will flourish. Then we, are, we all would become the uh, uh, beneficiaries. So it's a, it's a planned waiting period, but it, it, it never came. So uh, the, 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 the distinct identifiable group of the poor became poorer, you find in a small scale plantation, the laborers, they lost their income sources and recovery was difficult even as late as 2018. So then uh, government felt the, the seed is not a good thing to do. So PMU of the project, that is a project management unit, conducted a survey to see the seeds counting of the poor, and it revised it. It said, uh, oh, nearly 77% of the people, the, the, the seed identified as poor households were not poor. <laughs> it's an error. So in the end, only 22 households deserve the uh, uh, assistance to overcome their poverty. So no more poverty officially in from uh, Kottawa to uh, Gaul. Only 22 families, all others were well above. So, but what, 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 what the, the RDF forgot was, uh, in 2002, uh, the poverty index checked 3,000 rupees per family. That means at that time, official poverty line was about 1,400. So it was uh, multiply, multiply, multiplied by two, 3,000 as the... Uh, the threshold of poverty, but the same 3,000 increased to 6,000 by 2008. So we have to take 2008 amount as the basis for discussion. But some people who did the surveys, and they wrote reports also, they say, no, no, we should take 3,000 because that's the policy says. Actually, there was a policy error there and this was recently uh, uh, corrected and say you have to take the current status, not the old status. So you can see how, how widely these things, we had a lot of money, people, specialists, foreign specialists, local consultants, all these things generated a lot of uh, money for work, but they didn't generate enough money for to eradicate poverty or to minimize poverty. That's the basic problem. Millions were spent. You know, who, would, who, who expected someone to go and talk about compassion and peace to these people? I mean, th th there's no meaning. But the argument was, no, no. Th those are very important things. Otherwise, people, how to develop the, the cohesion of the society the integrity of the society, these things are more important, but they spent the money. And people waited this 
regional development to come. It's a widespread because we did a hundred individual uh, socioeconomic survey, and nearly 77, 78, almost 80 percent people said we are waiting for the, the the regional development and the rapid access all the way to Hamban, uh, sorry, Gaul, and then to Madara to help us to recover from our uh, uh, chronic poverty. So uh, ten years later. Uh, we we asked this uh, some people we asked people hundred uh, 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 respondents. This is the results we got. Better houses with better facilities, eighty seven percent. As I said earlier, they, they are very happy with the housing because this is where the money went. So, reasonable amount of people saying access to better education for kids, to electricity, transport improvement, and people can send their children to. Kalutara and various other places for uh, Gaul for tuition because of the bus service in 2011. So people were very happy, not very happy, but substantial amount of people felt a positive aspect of the project next to the housing. And, and few people said improved household income is so one fourth. This is because some people started to go further away from their villages to nearby towns and cities to get some jobs. Squatters that means landless people, they thought nothing else, but we got uh, better houses. And they did a, a very good job in their homesteads. If you go and see their homesteads, very well organized income generating activities are happening in this 10 purchase leases. So overall picture is not bad, but what, 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 what went wrong was bad planning and bad, bad uh, implementation. So simply because you have a, uh, poverty elevation uh, program, it does not necessarily mean that program is going to make people non-poor. No. It continues to do the same thing under different guises. That's the basic thing to remember. So it's about what uh, we discussed this one. Then I can give you a few examples. I randomly selected a couple of projects. Uh, in, in a place uh, uh, it's called um, Sukhevi Hydropower Project in Georgia. I just went through my notes and I found it's a private sector project supported by ADB. Uh, so this Sukhavi, Sukhavi is like a Sanskrit word, Sukhavi. They pronounce it Sukhavi. This, that project's basic problem was definitions. They define the way they want the, uh, the project affected person and the poor. What did they say was uh, only someone loses land to the project is a project affected person, not others. It's a, it's a basic statement. But our policy, the, the ADB policy, World Bank policy, or European Development Bank policy and IFC, they all contributed, contributed to this project. That's why I selected, but they said the, uh, no, no, nobody has to give any money if they don't do slant. But that was supported by the these banks also, although the policy is different because the the interest in pushing this project through for a private sector loan. So I was re even still thinking how dangerous it is. The second thing was. Uh, to avoid payment of uh, statutory or legal uh, compensation, they, the, the, the project authorities uh, uh, defined, they defined uh, the land acquisition as negotiated settlement. We, we go and talk to people and buy their land. We are not going to acquire land. According to our policy or the World Bank, uh, ADB policy or World Bank uh, uh, resettlement policy, you can have a negotiated settlement only if, if the negotiate, negotiations fail, you stop the project. But if the negotiations fail and you, you, still you are going to acquire the land, it is not negotiated settlement. Right? Anyway, you are going to acquire either 
whether, they, whether you give the land or you don't give the land. But it is not negotiation. Negotiation means if people don't agree, then you don't do the job. But the, so what they what they did was they said these are not resettlers. Then they negotiate with us. They are ordinary people. We are not going to give any money for these people, and there's no reason not to land needed. So then the in the donor said you you prepare resettlement plan. They got top class uh, company, a British company to write a resettlement plan in uh, four volumes. One of the best <laughs> plans, but not implemented. So they said, if you want the plans, hear the plans. But we are not going to do that because our understanding is these people are not resettlers. Even today, that's the argument. People went to various uh, agencies, but they're still trying to fight. And I happened to be one of the consultants at that time. So that's why I got this information. And, and uh, they said poverty reduction is not our concern. The project owner said, Poverty, poverty reduction is not our concern. And they got the people to sign an agreement saying, if I, mean, I can read that the word, the, the, bit, the agreement between the, uh, the borrower and the people was if any damage done to the project by the people and that damage should be paid, should be repaired by the people also. And we, we expect them to be uh, honorable. Uh, partners of this agreement. So all these things were loaded against these people. So if they went on a strike, they lose their land sometimes and they don't get anything. So it's a, I mean, it is very interesting uh, concept. So uh, income restoration, when we push for that, so uh, in, they said there's nothing called income restoration. We, we can give you some money on uh, uh, what is called corporate social responsibility, CSR. You know, so I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, tuition fees for about two hundred children is part of the CSR, or botanical or small botanical garden, eco tourism, three community buses, tra uh, training of street policemen, drainage program, supply of drinking water. But when you come to the home repairs and other things, they said, no, because this is a tunnel. They were building a big tunnel across the river. So the, the vibration of the, the blasts affected the houses. They said, oh, these things happened before we came here also. Before the project began, also people's houses got, in, got damaged by the uh, earthquakes, uh, you know, natural hazards, uh, uh, floods. But now also happening, but it's not, you can't put the blame on us. But this is where the uh, there's a legal statement uh, in in, uh, in criminal law. Basically, the the accused take the victim as he is. Let us say someone is uh, has a heart problem, and I go and slap him and he dies. I can't say he had the heart problem earlier. My slap was not the reason for his death. So I take the man or the individual or the project as it is. So you can bring other external information into that. So we argue that true, early also these hazards were there, but now the hazards happening because of the, the tunneling as well as because of the natural hazards. Therefore, you must take the responsibility and consider them as affected people. No, they said no. Because since time immemorial, this, this area is you know, earthquakes and f flash floods and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So these are the, the negotiations actually happening in the field. So not only Sri Lanka, in many countries. And uh, the, all the money shown in the uh, resettlement plan as compensation was uh, turn into a CSR, that is corporate social responsibility. That means, so you kill two birds with one stone. People were told, we are not, uh, we, are, we are not supposed to give you any compensation, but we give you some money in uh, corporate responsibility. So we are good people, we are honorable people. And we, and they conducted many research, uh, research related uh, consultations. If you see the reports, Every 
uh, fortnight there was a meeting every uh, month there was a report half year report of consultations they are very interestingly recorded but when you read the reports we, you can arrive at two uh, uh, conclusions there are reports it is good enough some, sometimes for the donors they have their they have conducted their consultation these reports are available that is a superficial level but the true level is these consultations were used to confuse the people they were told we are not going to give you any money but any anyway if you want any money you come to us through your municipality like that so the consultation contents are not consultative they are one way stories we don't give you money don't complain to uh, world bank or adb uh, we don't think you have drinking water problems <laughs> so these are re recorded but if you see the records it may be thousands of records of consultations but consultation means not recording consultation means uh, acting the actions should be recorded but there is not a single action recorded so this is very uh, stark example of doing things according to the need of the policy but not getting any results that's what i'm trying to emphasize so they got ngos but the ngos was ngos were told don't don't lead people to uh, have strikes against us if you have strike we take the police and you know take action against you so so people also got you know it's a, it's a, it's a peculiar situation in human mind when you are the, when you are tested against certain things you you accept it as normal so much so at least i can give, tell you at least four donors also accepted that they also said that yeah, there's they, what they say is they are that's okay they are nice people look they have a csr they have a, a grievance redress mechanism they have bus trips for school kids to see the waterfalls you know it's a very 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 palatable picture but that is not what is happening happening is draconian uh, the iron fist control of these people using the uh, the concepts and institutions which we have developed in the area of consultation meaningful consultation getting people's consent all these things are there they also do the same thing but in a different form that's what i mean that's the basic thing i want to tell you so uh um, people are told if you want to go and resettle you go and resettle we can we don't have money government can give you some money if you go we give you 5000 that is about uh, uh, 1000 dollars blanket payment you go there and you live there so there are there, these are recorded also but nobody took action because point the point is the borrowers fundamental premise that these people are not project affected people was was indirectly at least indirectly supported by the borrowers uh, the 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 donors that's the basic point and uh, i can say that because i was there so so what about the development development opportunities for these people they were told this power is not for you i mean they were not going to get any electricity because of the hydro power project there yeah, it is for the nation so the nation number one and you are you are just affected people and you have to make this sacrifice for the benefit of the the, the nation that sort of uh, ideological uh, uh, discussions also you know going through and people just kept quiet so see the uh, it's much better better than this project if you read the documents very clearly prepared and all the necessary requirements were met but when you probe into that which the banks didn't want to do you find um, it is not what is happening it is completely different storyline which was used to get the loan through now this is uh, this is uh, uh, example of, uh, probably the the borrow 
genuinely believed these people are not affected people and there's no need to consider them as affected people. But they, they decided to move on with the, their own concern. So another project, it, because this is uh, is called the Tina River Hydropower Project in Solomon Islands in the Pacific, uh, it's a completely different story because they were indigenous people. They had not only economic and social rights, they had uh, cultural rights also. Now, in our, our, our policies, cultural rights are not part of the uh, resettlement policy. It is part of the indigenous people policy. And that's the basic problem. So, they don't own any land. It is a communal land. So, the tribe owns the land and tribe leaders, uh, chiefs, they give the kitty. Any money coming from the uh, uh, filling of forest and selling the timber to uh, international logging agencies, that money goes to the the kitty of the the tribe leader. So he distributes the money and nobody knows. So these things cannot be handled with the safeguard policies. The safeguard policies fundamental assumption is it is dealing with private property. Acquisition means you take the property your property, I take. That's called acquisition. But if you're not the owner, I can't take from you. It, it's nobody's land. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the safeguard policies of uh, World Bank, uh, ADB especially, are not applicable to countries where you find uh, predominant land tenure is uh, communal. Communal lands were very difficult to apply because there's no acquisition from the people. And to whom can you pay the compensation? It is the, team, the captain, leader, uh, boss, chief, those are the names. He or she would take the money. And they go according to their own calculations, not according to our calculations. So um, equal amount of payment and these are not there. So to negotiate, to acquire land, it's difficult because Negotiations won't happen because people put the uh, uh, what's called the cultural cultural rights, cultural rights, and we when you put the cultural rights saying this is our sacred land, this is where our our uh, secrets are kept. So if you are going to discuss with you in this place, you are going to tell our secrets to you. Then from you, these secrets will be divulged to the our enemies. So this is the, the argument. So they, so consultations cannot be held the way we hold consultations here or in Sri Lanka or anywhere else because they have their own uh, suspicion, uh, exclusion of people. We don't want to discuss with these people. So I'm going to say these policies, uh, they are very good in, the, in, uh, in writing, but in different societies, they have their own way of... I'm not, I'm not trying to say they're right or wrong, but I'm trying to say they're different from... What we think one one is the uh, uh, private property concept. The second is uh, uh, compensation for whom. These things we don't know. And once I was told by one of the chiefs, you don't worry about uh, land acquisition. This and that. Don't bring these issues. You build the road to the uh, uh, hydropower project because uh, my people will follow my. Authority. So, can we consider that as consult consultation and counsel? I don't think so. But in a sense, yes. So, what really matters is to do a lot of field work and spend time with these people and trying to understand how they perceive their uh, concepts like uh, poverty, uh, entitlements, ownership, uh, the future. All these things we have to study very carefully to understand. Otherwise, what will happen is we will apply uh, uh, what we know, and we get um, bogged down with their with their own uh, uh, interpretations. So, uh, so in a big meeting, with, according to their style, all the twenty seven tribal uh, chiefs meeting, uh, we discuss. But when you go to that level, you find very similar what, what we normally know, they also think. 
So I, I found three statements. They said the impact of this proposed project, they said loss of commercially viable forest. That's a very reasonable thing. But that is very high level thinking. But lower level, they think you are going to stop me hunting in the area or okay, fishing in the field. But uh, the, the chief's level, they said loss of commercially viable forest. The second impact was loss of uh, non-timber forest resources. That is collection of fruits and uh, you know hunting. Third thing was they said the infrastructure. Well, at the moment, people can use the, the river bank to a, a, approach their relatives and others or go hunting or, or fishing. But if you are going to build a hydropower project, that access will be badly damaged. Now, now see, when you go, uh, the, the negotiations were more informed. We tend to get uh, sizable and more meaningful impacts that they also have. But if you stop at, uh, they say you don't come here and we'll, I'll kill you next time if I see you in our territory. There's a, it's a very uh, uh, unsophisticated level of research. So research has to be in depth and with a lot of uh, patience and time to identify how actually where we can stop. So now the project is going, but uh, this Tina project in Solomon Islands, the World Bank and ADB uh, co-financing it and uh, suddenly uh, World Bank told us ADB that uh, uh, these people are indigenous people therefore there is no need to prepare an indigenous people plan. Regional plan can take care of. At the DGS level they were discussed and dropped. So actually I prepared the uh, tribal plan. I was paid for that but it was never used because uh, it's a decision uh, uh, arrived at with the support of the uh, tribal people to consider them as ordinary people. That way, there will be a, a machinery to distribute millions of dollars, which are going to you know to be paid by the uh, the as part of the uh, loan uh, to pay for uh, what is called the uh, compensation. So, so compensation was created. Ownership was created for the purpose of channeling money, the money. So I think at the end, when the project is over, people will, people who are lying low now, they will bring their cultural rights again and say, you damage our sacred land, you damage my, where my God, where he leaves his uh, uh, hilltop and, and all these things will come. But at the moment they are very quiet because everybody was told that you will get some money. So. Let us go in. So in that sort of situation, uh, consultation, consent, uh, poverty alleviation, all these things are external concepts. So that's not very important. So I think we discuss nearly one and a half hours. I'm very thankful for listening. Thank you very much for uh, you know, new insights and new thinking and also new learning about the other countries. Um, I think in this resettlement issue, like I know for, for a fact in Nepal, of course, they have a Maoist government and you don't pay anything for it at all. So it's always a very sensitive area to work on. So thank you very much on the game. And thank you all for joining. Thank See you. you next time. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Mm -hmm.